Because some of y'all need to be messed with. Because, <laughs> you know, we got to get this right. We do, guys. We have to get this right. You know, last week I asked a question, what did Jesus die on the cross for? Think about that. It's a question we all need to answer. And the Bible is really clear what the answer is. But we somehow seem to get it wrong in the church. You know, we're preaching the law to people as pastors. I'm talking to pastors right now. We're in the pulpit. And we're preaching the law. We're under the wrong dispensation. Jesus changed everything, but we're still under the law. And we're telling people, you're a sinner. You're, you're, you're sinning, and you're going to go to hell. You're, you need to repent. You need to do all this stuff. And, and at one point in our lives, we all were. But once you become a believer, everything changes when you give your life to Jesus. And the cross illum illuminates grace into your life. So we need to understand this whole law versus grace thing and how it applies, how it works, because the law is the law. It's not changing. You hear me, right? The law isn't going to change. The Mosaic law were the rules. God made rules. He said, this you do, this you don't do. If you do this, you'll be blessed. If you do this, you'll be cursed. Under the law, that is true to this day, and it'll never change. The Ten Commandments are not going away. There's just one major problem with the Ten Commandments. You can't do it. Look at your neighbor and go, yeah, yeah, yeah no chance. I'm going to let you go a little longer on that one. Look at him and go, yeah, now you look at your neighbor that just said that to you and go, you're right. You can't do it. You cannot keep the law. But you're supposed to try as hard as you can. I'm not, get, I'm not throwing it away. I'm not saying it's invalid. It is perfect. We learned that last week that the law is perfect. It's been given for every possible Thing for you to know what is right and wrong, and now you know that all the things that you do wrong are wrong. Now, you do right things too, so I'm not just bashing you, but you do some wrong things every now and then, a couple of you. Not Annie, not Lisa. I mean, I wouldn't know. But the Mosaic law is rule keeping. If you keep them, you'll be blessed. If you don't, you won't be. The problem with rule keeping and trying to curve our behavior, you know, behavior modification doesn't work. Anybody ever try to change your behavior? Some, I won't say it doesn't work. In most situations and circumstances, behavior modification helps. <laughs> you know. We try to teach our kids. We try to train them what's right and what's wrong. And we have punishments. And, you know, I, I had, I, I don't know, I didn't say this in the first service. But, man, when I was in middle school, they had this thing called licks. Anybody remember what licks were? A couple of you? Yeah, some of the older folks. Kids in here that are in middle school or high school, when we misbehaved in school, they paddled you at the desk in front of the whole class. It was called Licks, and they had this big fiberglass paddle. Mr. Gerald at Clear Lake Middle School had a paddle this long with holes drilled in it, you know, and he said, Radlin, you're messing up, buddy. He said, one more, and I'm going to get, you're going to get Licks. You know, being the class cut up that I was in middle school, high school was a little easier because I was just like, whoa, dude, I'm good. I don't want to make any waves. But, dude. Pow! Take your breath away every time. And then you'd act tough like, I'm, I'm good. Right? Not going to let them see me hurting. 
It's like that sometimes, you know? We think that we think if we paddle each other enough, our behavior will change. If we beat each other up enough with the law, if, we, if the pastors tell the sheep that how bad they are, that maybe they'll get better. It doesn't work that way. What I need to tell you is that every, every bit of, of what you've done wrong in your life, Jesus paid for in full so that you could be set free under grace and experience the blessings of God in your life unlike anything you've ever experienced in your life. You can actually have a relationship with God now because he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You are free from sin and its effects. And you know what the biggest effect that sin has on you? It separates you from God. You are no longer separated from a holy God because you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are holy in spite of yourself. Even though you don't behave all the time. Because it's the only way God could have a relationship with you. It was to make you perfect, even though you're not. Otherwise, he would have to stay separated you, separated from you for eternity. Which is what hell is. Hell is simply just the absence of God. Everyone says, it's so horrible. Oh, I've read, I watched these videos on YouTube. It's horrible what they're saying. It is. But it's simply the absence of God. Everything else is just what sin produces and creates torture and torment. And Jesus released us from all of that. It changed everything. You know, last week we learned uh, about dispensations. And my wife's like, honey, Nobody knows what a dispensation is. I know you're a Bible scholar, but you need to simplify it. You need to tell people. You said that word like 30 times last week, and nobody knows what it means. You need to tell them what dispensation means. Does anybody agree with her? Okay, I, I, I'm, you know, I just think everybody knows these things, you know? I mean... So a dispensation is a way of ordering things. It's an administration or a system or a, a management style, okay? In theology, a dispensation, listen to me, is the divine administration of a period of time, okay? So we have all of these different dispensations that God has dealt with us. How many of you guys know that God dealt with Adam and Eve under the dispensation of innocence different than he dealt with them after they sinned. Because he's a holy God. Now they were perfect. They were holy. Now they ate of the tree and they knew, God knew they would. You know that God knew they were going to eat it when he put the tree in the garden, right? It wasn't like, oh no, they ate of the tree. You know, the Bible says Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. This is all part of the plan. You know, God built the plan this way because he had to create free will. God wanted to spend eternity with people that would choose him, that would choose Jesus Christ in their life. Think about that. He gave everyone, everyone free will. So under these dispensations, though, God's dealing with people differently, every one of them. And we talked last week about uh, the fifth dispensation, which was called the dispensation of the law, number five, right? When the Ten Commandments were given, everybody's watched uh, Moses and on, on Easter, you know, and they cross through the Red Sea and the people are free, you know, and then they just start going crazy. And he's like, oh, man, we need some rules. So God had to show us what sin was. He had to show us where sin exists. And he literally created the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law, which is about 615 different laws and ways for you to behave. Don't eat this. Don't do that. If you do this, you're going to be stoned. If you do this, you're going to have to make sacrifices. It's all rules, right? Does anybody like rules? Some of you do. Come on, I know there's the rule lovers. 
Where are they? Yes, I knew Paul Hoskins was a rule lover. I've been on missions trips with him. No, we're not supposed to do it that way, Pastor. <laughs> I'm teasing. But, you know, the sixth, we're, we're not under the fifth dispensation anymore. We're not under the law anymore. The Ten Commandments were simply to show you that you can't live your life without grace. That's its purpose. It's to point you to the need of, of a Savior in your life, to point you to a place where you're like, I can't do this. And the, 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 the Jewish people were, were struggling, man. They could not keep the law. God even instituted animal sacrifices so that the animals would be sacrificed. The people would lay hands on the animal and they would pass their sins to the animal and the priest would kill the animal on an altar, right? And it was in the first tabernacle, which was a tent. The priest would, could you imagine being a, you know, a Levitical priest in, in those days, and what did you do? What do you do for a living? Oh, I just kill animals all day for people's sins. That's what I do, and then I burn them, and I throw them, and some, we get to keep whatever we, we're, the certain ones were allowed, and we get to eat that, and, you know, that's my job. I just kill animals all day for people's sins, because, you know, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin, right? So, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. There's the two dispensations and the change of dispensations right there in that scripture. The wages of sin is death. The animal had to die. The altar was there. The priests were doing it, okay? And then in all of that, we learned also that you can rightly divide the word or you can wrongly divide the word. So the... the the word, it's in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if we're rightly dividing this Bible, if we're reading it and we're appropriating it properly, it will help us in our life. But you can wrongly divide the word. You can teach under the law, which is a big portion of what's in this book. And leave grace out of it, and now you've just created a bunch of rules for people to have to obey. It's called religion. It's called religion. You know, or you can change the dispensation to the dispensation of grace, which is the one we're in now, right? And have a relationship. See, you only had religion under the law. There was no relationship with God because you were sinful. You were just trying to cover your sins every year. Every person would have to go and sacrifice. It's crazy, isn't it? I'm going to skip around, Richard. Hang on. Do you know that, you know, there was the tabernacle, there was a temple that Solomon built, and that was destroyed Another temple was built. It was destroyed. Do you realize that the, the, the Jews have not had a temple in hundreds of years? Hundreds of years. So they have not been making sacrifices. If they are under the Mosaic law, which is the way they believe, because they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, so therefore there is no dispensation of grace for them. They're still under the law. They can't keep it. We all no, we can't keep it, but they are not making sacrifices in the temple to cover their sins, so they are not covered. See, the problem with all that is, is that the dispensation has changed and animal sacrifice, even if they were doing it, doesn't work for them anymore because Jesus was the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. His sacrifice changed the, the, the direction that God was dealing with us. Does that make sense? You know they're going to build a third temple? They're, they already have the plans. They've already got it. They're working on it. The only thing they don't have is the land. There's a mosque built on the Temple Mount right now in Israel where, they, where the original temples were built. There is a mosque, a, a, a temple built on that property. 
so they can't build their temple there. So they've been working on trying to create a shared agreement to build the temple next to the mosque so that the, you know, the Palestinians and the Israelis will share the temple mount. How many of you guys know how well that's going to go? Okay. I'm not knocking anybody, but I'm just telling you, this is what all that tension's about. Because the Jews need a temple and they can't build it anywhere but on the temple mount. Then they're going to build it. It's prophesied. It will happen in our lifetime probably. And in that process, they're going to reinstitute animal sacrifice and PETA is going to come unglued. Every Jewish person in the world will travel to Israel once a year to make their sacrifice in the temple and blood will spill because they're still going to try to live under the dispensation of the law. When really, once and for all, Jesus' blood has already been spilled for the sins of the entire world. You know that Jesus shed his blood for every sin that exists, every vile, demonic, evil thing you could fathom somebody doing in this world has been paid for by the blood of Jesus. He's washed every sin off every person in the world. He took it all on himself at the cross. But now we're faced with a decision now Jesus is saying the grace dispensation has been opened to you. You have been given grace. Will you receive that grace by accepting the gift of perfection from God who himself became a man and himself came to this world and laid his life down for you? Do you see it? Are you beginning to see the picture? No person could pay for their sins. So God became a person and paid for our sins for us to release us and to give us positional righteousness to make us perfect even though we're not so that we could boldly come to the throne of grace. I'm all over my notes, Richard. I'm sorry, bro. Oh, you're following me, but he can't because he's got notes and I'm all over the place. No, it's bad today. So God has changed the way that he's dealing with mankind. He's not dealing with us under the law. He's not, you know how people are always like, yeah, that God in the Old Testament, he's so angry. What's wrong with him? Seems like he hates everybody. He's a holy God having to deal with an unholy people and they're not obeying the rules and they're not doing the sacrifices and his judgment is coming on them because of of his holiness. And there was only one way to release all of that. It was to pay for the sins of every one of us himself. God had to pay for it himself so we could be set free. That's why our Bible says, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Free from what? Sin. You are not a sinner if you are in Christ. You are a saint. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You've been made perfect and holy and acceptable in his sight. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Sin required your death. And Jesus died that death for you so that you could have eternal life in him. It's a gift. But the problem with that is that it's been made available to every sinner, every vile murderer, killer, whatever you can put in there. Every last one of those people, grace is available for them. Some of you are going to be like, how did they get here? And they're going to have used the dispensation of grace in their life. And they've truly repented and called on Jesus Christ, even on their deathbeds. And God has forgiven them. Because if he can't forgive everybody, he can't forgive anybody. So if you can't forgive everybody, you can't forgive anybody. Right? Right? But it's because of the grace of God, not because of the law. 
right? It's why God's so frustrated when we're like in unforgiveness and we're struggling and we're dealing with all this stuff and we're telling people, you know, I don't want anything to do with you. You're probably the closest thing to Jesus they're ever going to find. And the enemy's doing everything he can to keep you away from them. Right? So that they will not truly accept Jesus in their life. Because that's the only difference. Every sin's paid for. The only difference between heaven and hell is who will choose to accept the free gift of God's grace in Christ. So it's not sin that puts people in hell. It's their refusal to accept God's one and only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Because I had to pay for your sins and nobody else could do it. So that's why he's the only way. It's why all the other religions don't work. Because they all require, like the law, you to do something. If something's like, if you do this, God will do that. That's the law. Or that's a false religion. Because in our dispensation of grace where God is dealing with mankind now, it's like, Jesus did this, so you get this. No strings attached. It's yours for free. How do I get back on my notes? I have no idea. <laughs> it's okay. So, did that covenant. Let's talk about the new covenant between God and, and believers. You know, the system of animal sacrifices, that lasted for hundreds of years but even so, it was temporary. It was God out of his love making a way for people to be covered. But out of love, he sent his son for us. See, the, the new covenant didn't, see, in the old covenant, your sins were covered and you'd have to go back every year. And if you did any real bad sins, you'd have to go immediately and, and do another sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Oh, I'm messing up, I'm messing up. The priest is like, dude, I've killed 23 animals this week. What's going on with you? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, but see, Jesus fixed it once and for all. He was the final sacrifice that was ever going to be made. That's the new covenant. See, Jesus, he went around teaching and instructing people, and he was showing everybody through signs and wonders. He's doing miracles. He's like basically like, I am God. And they killed him for saying that he was God, and he was God. And I'm here to take away the sins of the world. And they killed him, but it was the plan. God knew they would kill him. See, if Satan knew when he was working the crowd, when he was getting everybody riled up against Jesus, that was the big catch-22. God's like, I got you because I know you, enemy. I know how you're thinking. I know how you're going to react. And he, he put all of that together, and he rose the people up against Jesus, and they crucified him on the cross. And that was the plan. So don't think God can't work around your situation. Don't think God can't fix whatever it is you're going through. He was able to get your redemption brought through in this world through his planning and preparation. And he has plans and preparations for your life. Right? He's working behind the scenes. What does the scripture say? All things are working together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's a, that's a bonus right there. I didn't say that in the first service, so that's for somebody. God is working for you. He, Jesus is interceding for you. He's at the right hand of the Father going, Lord, get it to them. Father, get it to them. Let's bless them. Let's, let's, let's get that to them. They need help. They need this. They need that. Whatever it is, they need peace. They need deliverance. Let's get it to them. He's a high priest who is fervently interceding for each and every one of you. 
You know, Moses was the mediator of the uh, original covenant under the Old Testament where the animals were being sacrificed, and then Jesus was the mediator of the new covenant. So there's two covenants that are happening there. But Jesus is a faithful high priest. He came and lived the same life that you've lived, yet without sin, because he was God, he didn't have sin in him, right? It's the only way you could live your life without sin. You were born in sin, never stood a chance. You didn't. You didn't ask for it. That's why it says through one man's sin entered into the world and through another man righteousness entered into the world. If you couldn't help the fact that you were born in sin, then God's going to give you an equal opportunity to be, get your righteousness back. You see it, right? Adam sinned. You got, everybody got sin from that. Adam and Eve, right? Then through Jesus Christ, we can all get your righteousness back. By faith in him, simple belief and faith that Jesus is the sacrifice for your sins. It's powerful. Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Somebody say weaknesses. But with all points, was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of what? What dispensation are we in? Doesn't say let us come therefore boldly in obedience to the law. Does it? So, so let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of of need. He commended his love towards us that while we were sinners, he died for us. He gave his life. You know, the Old Testament is Israel struggling and failing to keep their covenant with God. That's why it's all in there. You can read it. They were all blowing it. In the New Testament, we get grace. It's the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. The old covenant was only for the Jewish people. All you Gentiles, you're, you were done for. You didn't, stay, you, weren't, you didn't get in. That was just for God's chosen people, the Jewish race. See, God knew all along he was going to break it wide open and he was going to extend grace to every human being on the planet. So you've been saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God that was originally given to, to the Jews and now we have been grafted in and the church is now growing because everyone is under grace. The dispensation has changed. God's not just dealing with a system that he put in place for his own people. He's now dealing with a system that he put in place for all people. But it all came from a covenant that he made. Here's the bottom line. Grace was always the plan. It just took God 4,000 years to be able to get himself into the planet. As Jesus. It took a lot of work. The enemy was trying, you know, the enemy was trying to pollute the bloodline of humanity to the point that, that God would not be able to get a righteous seed for his son to come through. That was part of the flood. God had to wipe out the earth because the, the bloodline of humanity was being so tainted that he was not going to be able to get the Messiah into the world. And that's why the world was flooded. There's the Nephilim. We could get into all that, but you guys are like, ooh, please. Not today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it all... It all changed at the cross. 
Everything changed. Everything changed. God's not mad anymore. Because all of his wrath was poured out on Jesus on the cross. He took it all. Now God's pleased. He's happy with those who will accept the gift of his son. Now you can choose not to accept Christ and pay for the punishment of your own sins. You have free will. And you can do that. I don't recommend it. Fall on grace. Hebrews 10, 17 through 20. We're almost there. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. You can have boldness to enter into the presence of God if you'll enter it through grace by the blood of Jesus in your life. Well, God, I don't ever really feel like God talks to me. I need, I want to have a relationship with God. You're going to have to come to Jesus Christ. You're going to have to fall on grace and you're going to have to believe in the gift that God gave each and every one of us on the cross. You know the cross was an altar? Did you know that? You had the tabernacle, you had the temple, you had the other temple. God built the last and final temple that will ever be needed. It was the cross. He sacrificed his son on it so that you could be set free. Here's the clincher. Every human heart has an invisible altar on it that is waiting for that life to be sacrificed for God. You can choose to live your life any way you want, but when you choose to recognize the altar of your heart and say, I am going to lay my life down for God, for Christ, life comes. When Jesus laid his life on the cross, we were given life. When you lay your life down on that altar of your heart and you choose to do God's will for your life, life comes to you. And eternal life is the greatest of rewards. It's ours. We've already been given it. We're living in it as dual citizens in the earth right now. You're already in heaven. Doesn't our scripture Bibles tell us that we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. <laughs> so we're dual citizens. Hebrews 9, 11, and I'll close. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. say good things we serve a God of good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle that was not made with hands that is not of this creation not with the blood of goats and calves but with his own blood he entered the most holy place in heaven once and for all having obtained eternal redemption For if the blood of the bulls and goats and ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified for the the purifying of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works so you can serve the living God. We got to put our past behind us, guys. We got to allow heaven to purge us to release us from the wounds and from the hurts and from the pain of our past. And we've got to rely and come to the throne of God's grace and be free in Christ and allow his blood to cleanse us. To purify us before God.
everything that you struggle with. came from a thought. Everything you struggle with. The Bible says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What does that mean? That I take every thought and I process it through the altar of my heart and I say, God, release me from this pain. Release me from this anger. Release me from this depression. Release me from this fear. Whatever it is, God will release you from it. So that you can walk in the newness of life that is found in Him. Knowing who you are in Christ. Knowing what the blood of Jesus has done for each and every one of us. Knowing that we're under a different dispensation of grace, not under the law. We're not being judged by God. His judgment came on His Son. Romans 5, 18. If, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. You're free. Listen to me. You're free. You're free. Live for God. Lay aside every weight that so easily distracts you and besets you. Come to the throne of grace. Receive forgiveness. And then walk into the throne room of God. And hang out with your creator. You can do that. Let's bow our heads. Father, I just thank you. Every person in this room is so precious to you. There's not one of them that you didn't pay that price for. I pray that they would reach into heaven right now, that they would reach to you, Jesus, in their lives, that they would call on the name of Jesus and be saved, that they would just accept that free gift of your grace if you're here today and you say, man, I need the grace of God in my life. I need Jesus. I don't know that I've ever given my life to Jesus. Would you just lift your hand if there's anybody in here and say, that's me. I need, I need Christ. You put it down. You put it back down. I see him. Anyone else? It's me. I need Jesus. Yep. Just say this with me. Just say, Jesus, thank you for your grace. I receive the gift from you of eternal life. It's that simple. Amen. 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 Now, just go and live your lives for the Lord. Be excited. Go bless a waitress. Go buy somebody some gas. Do something. Faith without works is dead. Go do something. Serve the Lord today. Amen. Love you guys.